Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Bryn with a train by Tex here today. Very excited about what we have to share with you. We wanted to be the first. Of course, we're not. PicoScope was the first, obviously. Steve Scott with Simply Diagnostics has done some videos, and as well as Paul Danner with Scanner Danner, of course. Uh, if you haven't checked out their stuff, be sure to do so. And what I mean by checked out their stuff, I, I of course, mean specifically to the new PicoScope 4425A. So we've had our advanced kit for a couple of weeks now. It's been a heck of a lot of fun playing with this thing. The features that you guys are probably, many of you are already aware of, you're, that may be even driving you to consider buying one of these kits. Yes, those features are really awesome. Of course, we're talking about the automatic probe detect kit uh, or function. Um, that's really a big one. And the other big one for me is the fact that we don't have to worry about 9 volt batteries anymore specifically talking about current clamps man that's a really awesome feature so thank you so much for hanging out it's been far too long we look forward to working together on this one it's a 2000 something Yukon hybrid with a cylinder misfire so not only we get to show you the 4425A advanced kit we get to show you as we diagnose a cylinder misfire on this Yukon. So thanks for joining us. Uh, let's get started. So there she is. Isn't it awesome getting new stuff? Ta-da. There she is. Pico Scope 4425A. And that's the real deal right there. That's what it's all about. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, this is a BNC plus connection now. So instead of just this area here, that's BNC. Just like that. We now have these little guys here. There's LEDs in here as well. But these little guys here tell the scope module which in turn tells the software what probe you're putting in. Automatically detects what probe you're putting in, which is awesome. So, let me get this up closer. You see you have the low amp clamp here. The beauty is, again, that you don't have to worry about nine volt batteries. For those of you that know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, the pain is real. You put a nine volt battery in place, maybe you don't want to leave it in because you're, you're using a, you know, an alkaline and you're afraid it's going to leak in. Or maybe you got uh, nickel metal hydride or lithium rechargeables and you're leaving them in, but you, you know, every seems like every time you turn the clamp on the battery's dead or you just don't know. Uh, pretty awesome stuff. So that's the low amp clamp and uh, the BNC plus connection. Pretty awesome. Here's the high amp clamp. The low amp clamp's a single mode. You know, in the past it's been uh, like a 20 amp or a 60 amp mode, or but in this case it's a single mode. Of course, um, just makes it simple when you for the uh, probe automatic probe detection. It just knows well you got a 60 amp clamp. You don't have to physically change anything. You don't have to tell it oh we're in a 20 amp mode or a 60 amp mode. It just knows it's a 60 amp clamp, and all you have to do is change your scaling. So here you are with the high amp clamp, and this is a 2000 amp clamp, again, single mode. The other one is a 200-2000, but because we're using a probe to auto detect, it just knows right away that this is the 2000 amp clamp and you just have to change the scaling. But the thing that's cool about these, other than the obvious part, that you don't have to worry about batteries. My goodness gracious, that is awesome. Uh, it detects it automatically, but this uh, high amp clamp, the, the, it's so narrow. And it's, it seems like you could probably get in a lot of really cool areas with it. Um, most of you are already familiar with these uh, acupuncture probes, what I call them. I think AES Wave is 
the ones that initiated them, but um, very cool. Probably my favorite back probes, and you have many replacement needles there. And then you have your red hooks. And of course, alligator clips and different things here. Hold on one moment for me. I'm gonna get in front of you here. What hasn't changed is the fact that they just put too much stuff in these cases, right? But that's all right. I mean, as diagnostic technicians or even mobile technicians, well, more as diagnostic technicians in shops, you're gonna probably set up some kind of cart. That's one example. Here's another example. You're gonna set up a cart and put this stuff on there. I haven't done that yet, because uh, I'm probably gonna ship this around to my uh, other train by Tex partners. But uh, your regular test leads, green of course, channel C, red channel B, blue channel A, and yellow or gold, however you wanna call it, channel D. Um, this inline connector, I try not to mess with harnesses until I've gotten a pretty good idea what's going on, but this, I gotta say, this is a nice feature. Um, I've already used this on cam and crank sensors. USB 2.0 and 3.0 comes with it. That's the, uh, the 2.0 is much longer, the 3.0 is a little shorter. And uh, paddle on probe, set. Really, again, it's all about that BNC Plus. So you plug that into the scope and it automatically detects that you're using the paddle on probe. That's a big deal for several reasons. One, you're moving probes around on the scope and you maybe you forget to change you know, the channel information, channel settings, and you go to capture a waveform, especially maybe on an intermittent, and you realize after you, it acted up, you finally acted up, you thought you captured a waveform, you forgot to change the probe on your channel settings. That's uh, devastating. The cool thing about this is it automatically detects it. Um, many of you are already aware of these, but these fuse loops are really cool because you can um, you know, remove a fuse, plug this into place, put the fuse in here, put your current clamp around here to measure current, and then your voltage uh, lead you could plug into there so you can monitor voltage and current at the same time. Um, has the Maxi, the Mini, the ATC, and the, what I believe is fairly new, is the uh, J case, which is cool. Uh, coil unplug extension probes here. That is, of course, you know, some of the coil unplugs are, well, that's obviously the most prominent uh, coil system on the market. And some of the coils are so shielded you can't get a good secondary waveform. So uh, in this case, you would remove the coil out of the spark plug tube, put one of these extensions in place, and then use uh, your regular secondary lead clamped around these coil and plug extensions. It's very cool. Uh, and just as mentioned a moment ago, your regular uh, ignition secondary leads. You have uh, your six-way, I believe they're called, whatever uh, they're called, their breakout lead sets by Pico, or branded Pico. These things are awesome. If you haven't uh, seen them, check them out. Um, I should have had that open for you. I apologize. Um, another inline deal here for, um, Again, I like to try to not mess with harnesses, but it is cool sometimes to be able to plug this into the vehicle harness and the sensor and be able to measure what you need to measure. Uh, injectors, crank sensors, whatever, whatever fits. Uh, temperature probe, that's pretty new. As well as what's brand new to this scope, I believe is the ability to measure resistance, which you would use this lead for. Ultrasonic. Uh, detection, I think for Parkade, I think in some case keyless entry, I can't remember. Uh, at one time they had two different leads, they may just be using one. This one doesn't have the BNC Plus, which is fine. That's one thing I forgot to mention, if I can put this stuff back, uh, is you can still use regular BNC leads. So if you already have BNC stuff or your old Pico, it'll still work. You And you, you just have to go in and tell the channel what, what probe you're using. No big deal. It's just cool, you know, to buy the kit and have these BNC pluses to where a large percentage of the stuff that you're plugging in, it automatically detects them. 
This is the thing that I was referring to a moment ago. If, if, if I wasn't, I forget, I forgot, and I apologize. But uh, this being the 4425A, of course, the beauty is that, the BNC Plus. Again, you can use your regular BNC stuff on it, but those small little six contacts there, that's what determines which probe you're sitting in, putting in, so it automatically detects it. This scope module is very similar, if not exactly the same, to the 4425A with, regard, with the exception of a couple of things, mainly that BNC Plus connection. But the main point I'm trying to make is it's still 200 volt maximum input. That's pretty safe for most things. If you're looking at ignition primary, um, you definitely want to use an attenuator. In the past, you would use an external attenuator. I don't have some of the new ones, but I have some of the old ones. This is the old one, 20 to 1. Uh, basically, what that does is reduce the voltage coming into the module. So in our case, if, it's, if we are measuring something we think is more than 200 volts, we want to reduce it before it goes into this box so that you don't do any damage to your equipment. You would use an attenuator. In the past, this is what they would look like. This is a 20 to 1. So it would reduce it 20 times. And if you told the scope module you're using a 21 to attenuator, the software would already mul multiply or the uh, measurement that's coming in 20 times so it would be displayed as your measure as you know as the circuit is live what's changed is there's no external attenuation or attenuators for this kit but you still have 10 to 1 attenuation but it comes in this in the form of this which is uh, a, a lead that they were already selling for in the automotive sector but it was more for high-speed networks flex ray and stuff like that uh, it's so it is for high speed signals, it's got the bandwidth for it, but also I don't know that I can get it to focus. Yeah, yeah kind of focus. 10 to, times 10. So that's a 10 to 1 attenuator right there. Um, under the scope module, right there, there's little baggies. They have these adapters. This a 10 to 1 attenuator lead just has this kind of sharp point on it. And these adapters are so that you can use your test leads on the end of that for a measurement if you need to. Um, when I mean test leads, you can put those back probes on there, you can put piercing probes on there, alligator clips. Uh, this is a, in the bag as well, and this is your ground lead, because on this scope module you need to ground every channel. Uh, on this scope one, my old one is a, three, a 4000 series, 4423. 100 volt maximum input, but you, you only wanted to ground one channel on that. The 4425 and the 4425A, you want to ground every channel. So that's it. That's the 4425A. Really exciting. Let's uh, see if we can't use it to fix a vehicle here. So, like I mentioned a moment ago, what is this? It's a 2009 Yukon hybrid, has a cylinder misfire, cylinder six. So it has a PO, PO 300, uh, you, it acts up, st start the key immediately. You're not in the frame, I don't think. You have to come closer. I know you smell, but you don't have to worry about insulting me. Uh, PO 300, PO 306, you actually had a cylinder six code in there, right? No, not a cylinder okay, six. Okay, that's I typical. For those of you guys, you know, GM is pretty typical. They don't give a lot of cylinder specific misfire or uh, codes. I think I heard on the global side you get more of those cylinder specifics, but when you go on the hand side you usually get a PO300, at least for a large portion or a large generation, certain generations, but PO300 runs rough immediately. Uh, let's walk through the process. We've already pretty much spent some time on this, I won't lie, Carlos, I shouldn't say we, Carlos. Um, so let's walk through what uh, runs rough immediately, what do we do? Um, first thing I would do is just look at scan data. On this one, you look at scan data, scan you can data. see misfires misfire counting six. on six, yep. okay. You got the old uh, modus out, started playing. Yeah, I got modus out. You looked at some data, you, you determined that it was probably going to be a misfire, ignition, ignition issue. issue. Okay, yeah. so you got the scope out and you looked at uh, trigger for six. Trigger for you six. You looked at current for all four cylinders on that bank, which is injectors and ignition, right? Correct. And you looked at, uh, used a secondary lead to look at six, and you weren't seeing anything, right? Correct. So you moved it to other ones, and you were seeing the secondary lead waveform on the other cylinders, but you weren't seeing it for six, which is, again, the cylinders mis yeah. that's misfiring, causing the run rough condition. Very cool. We looked at it on a modus. Guys, snap on. They, man, they're respectable scopes. They are. But uh, 
We're, we're gonna get there. We're gonna we're gonna play with the Pico, and we're gonna see how this looks on the Pico. Uh, so uh, let's take a look. I wish there was background music as I slowly fade into this beauty here. Angelic singing, maybe. Maybe a bald eagle flying in the sky behind. It'd be kind of weird considering it's uh, the backdrop is the hood. <laughs> Pico 4425A, here it is. So you have your USB, of course, plugged into the laptop. Uh, channel A is going to the trigger of ignition coil six, which you'll, maybe you'll take my word for it, but I'll have it back here. We did pierce the wire. We always pierce the wire, guys. Almost never do anything but pierce because we want to make sure we have a good connection. Channel B, where is channel B going? Channel B is the secondary lead. Um, where the heck is it? Hmm, I think you can barely see it down there. There it is. Now that's on ch uh, ignition coil four, because we want to show you a good one first. And then channel C here, there's my hand. Uh, this is the 60 amp clamp on the fuse that powers the ignition coils and the injectors on bank two. Okay, uh, so you can see there's LEDs on this end. Um, we'll show you what it looks like on channel D when it's not plugged in. You still have some lit up. You hear that click, and now you can see there's more LED lit up there. So I'll show you here on the scope this is where I'm not gonna be fancy guys but uh, you click the A and you can see it's already times one that's the one that's uh, we're reading the control to cylinder number six coil so it is times one channel B is the secondary ignition probe we have plugged in on cylinder number four's ignition lead these aren't coil on plugs guys are coil near plugs you guys that work on GM's know that the, for those of you that don't, uh, I forgot to mention that, I apologize, but you have a coil and you have a lead that goes down to the spark plug. And then channel C is that 60 amp clamp. We didn't go in there and change that. It automatically detected, which is awesome. But the cool part is uh, that it does that and all we have to go in and do is just change your scaling, your voltages. And uh, let's pull this down and We'll go, we'll go 20 kV for now. And then I think, I think 20 amps to start on the current. I think 10 might be suffice. Let's start it up, Carlos. Really healthy, right guys? Is that uh, what you were referring to? Yeah. <laughs> There's a smile that we want to see. All right, let's take a look. I must have stopped it. Okay, we decided to do a voiceover at this section because there's a couple of missed opportunities that we wanted to take care of. One thing is we didn't mention the obvious thing, which you guys have probably picked up on, is the engine noise. You could hear that the engine is running rough, but you could also hear some engine noise at this point. One thing I wanted to bring up here is with hybrids, for any misfire, whatever the cause of the misfire, it's not uncommon at all for the engine to sound like it has catastrophic internal damage. At least on the vehicles that we're familiar with, which is Priuses or other vehicle manufacturers that are modeled after the Prius hybrid system. Uh, I don't have a, much experience with these Yukons. They're kind of like unicorns, these hybrid Yukons. Uh, GM2 mode hybrid trucks. I can't recall the last time I've really even done any drivability or 
uh, testing on them. So, uh, but that's the reason we really didn't mention it before is because, uh, again, it's not uncommon for engine noises to occur when there's simple cylinder misfires that are taking place. So, a couple other things we didn't uh, do a, a good job during this presentation initially hence the reason we're in this screen recorded section here is the elephant in the room at this point is the terrible secondary ignition waveform that we have here which brings us to another point with regard to using the Pitaco scope 4425A something to consider because it's a auto probe detect you may easily just plug that secondary ignition probe in and let it automatically detect it and really not go in there and um, make sure that the right selection is made. If you recall, when you're using um, the secondary ignition probe settings with older platforms that don't do auto detect, you have many options. You have distributor style, you have distributor list style, which of course would be like a wasted spark system. Within that you would need to consider positive fire versus negative fire and you obviously have the coil unplug um, probe as well so just something to consider you may have to go in there and physically make some ad fine adjustments with that probe depending on the ignition system that you're using in this case we really weren't interested in getting true secondary ignition analysis or to you know, acquiring a really good waveform, we were mostly just going to compare this cylinder, which is cylinder number, I think it's two, um, to six. And six is the suspect coil, and two is the non-suspect coil. So usually I'll do that. I'll get a, a waveform on a on the good cylinder compared to the bad cylinder, but I do so in a much better way, generally speaking. Now with Pico, uh, and there's some things with regard, with regard to secondary ignition I want to talk about for best practice or at least best practice in my experience. With Pico, I usually put a lot of time on the screen and then zoom in. This just works out for most of what you need to do. But when it comes to secondary ignition, I usually approach it differently. I, whatever channel I'm using to measure secondary ignition, I will use a trigger on that channel, and I will put a lot less time on the screen. Ten, uh, one to two milliseconds per division, which is ten to twenty milliseconds sweep speed, and I'll just make fine-tune adjustments until the known good secondary waveform looks like it should and then from there I'll check the bad one and just kind of compare. Again in this case we didn't do that it was really more just kind of a quick uh, comparison from one to the next and um, mostly again just to demonstrate this scope really with a broken car is kind of like a cherry on the top so that's kind of how we do it, uh, but in this case, I'll just kind of cover some of the basics here. We have a phase ruler at one ignition event for cylinder number two. The second phase ruler lined up here with the next ignition event for cylinder number two. Of course, at 720 crank degrees, we would expect to see four ignition events, four injector events in this case, because they share the same fuse for that bank. And we see that. We see, focus on the taller ones here, which are the ignition coil um, current ramps. And you can see the at a glance they're the same current level the same signature if it was an open here's the blue trace for uh, trigger for cylinder number six that's our suspect coil so if we went up here this is cylinder number six current ramp if it was open we would be missing this current ramp altogether if the coil primary was shorted instead of the gradual increase we would see a rapid increase in current for this ignition coil six we're not seeing that so the primary side looks good uh, but that's pretty much it for this. We'll go ahead and check the other one and uh, go from there. So we've moved the secondary ignition probe here, which is red trace here. We've moved it from cylinder number four to cylinder number six, which cylinder number six is our suspect cylinder. So when we compare cylinder number four here to cylinder number six here, again, cylinder number four is the red trace secondary ignition. For, uh, obviously, it, it's a bad waveform, right? I've already uh, mentioned that just a moment ago. I don't know how many times I have to apologize for this before you guys will give me some uh, cut me some slack here. But um, ultimately, yes, it's a bad waveform. All kidding aside, but when you compare cylinder four to cylinder number six, you know there's at least some activity here. And here, there's no activity. There's no discernible, discernible secondary ignition event here. So this is why Carlos made the decision he made. But before we gave the client an estimate, we decided 
uh, or Carlos decided to swap the coils and kind of reassess. And when he did, he found that cylinder number six ignition uh, misfire was still present. Hey guys, it's like 1.24 a.m. Uh, no, it is 1.24 a.m. I'm working on this video at 1.24 a.m. Um, probably not even looking in the right direction. That's how tired I am. I'm in my van in my garage so that I could speak at a normal volume without waking everybody else up in the house. But I, where did we left off? Uh, Carlos swapped the coils. Um, you know, secondary ignition is, is tough. Analyzing ignition is all is tough. At all is tough. You know, current ramping coils is pretty easy. But when you're talking about primary and secondary voltage, especially secondary voltage, it is kind of tough. Uh, Carlos is definitely new to trying to analyze analyzing uh, ignition, so he wanted to back it up with swapping coils, and that's kind of that's what that's a great idea. That's what you need to do. So he swapped the coil, and unfortunately, the misfire did not uh, move. It stayed with cylinder number six. So after a little bit, he decided to ask me to um, step in and see if we can't see what's going on. Are you sitting down? I hope you're sitting down because I have a really big surprise for you guys. The surprise is that this vehicle has a valve train concern causing our cylinder six misfire. Our 2009 GMC Yukon Hybrid six liter has a valve train issue causing a cylinder six misfire. Are you guys are surprised, right? No, you're probably not. If your experience is anything like ours, you're not surprised at all that there's a valve train concern causing our misfire. You're probably more surprised earlier when you thought that we might be dealing with an ignition coil fault that's causing our cylinder six misfire. Of course we found that that's not the case which made this video even more interesting. You're welcome at this point. You're welcome. Anyways, uh, decided to do a little scan tool testing once Carlos asked me to get involved and we could see, uh, you know, we did injector balance tests and everything looked good there. Uh, data to me suggested we were definitely not dealing with an ignition issue because we didn't swap the spark plugs or the plug wires. So we could still be dealing with an ignition issue, but looking at scan data, at least in my case, my, the, what I reported uh, or found was different than what Carlos had reported earlier on. So we decided it was time to start looking at uh, possible mechanical concerns causing this. So uh, what I decided to do is actually just have the vehicle running at idle, uh, trigger the ignition coil for number one, which is here in a blue trace and measure the intake manifold pressure using the WPS 500 uh, which is the red trace. Um, this is basically what I'm going to do to try to test mechanical. Usually I do I start with the relative compression synced with an ignition and intake manifold pressure but because this is a hybrid it's not quite the same. It doesn't support clear flood and I just felt like it was quicker for me to just idle the thing measure manifold pressure and sync the ignition which I've done. Ignition blue trace is synced to ignition ignition number one so right here is when ignition uh, one or cylinder one's ignition event took place. Uh, we decided to put our current phase rulers up. Phase rulers up. Here's the first one, the second one at the next ignition one event and between the two we know is 720 degrees which is each cylinder has a chance to have its four strokes right so uh, we're focusing on intake pressure here to see if we can't get an idea what's going on with this engine and let me go over that real quick how do we get these if you'll see in blue we have the firing order plotted out for each cylinder um, ba you know the ignition event basically the firing order being one eight seven two six five four three but the red trace is different and that's because we're trying to mark our intake strokes and we know that the intake stroke doesn't happen at the same time as the ignition or you know compression stroke we know that this ignition event happens at the top dead center compression so how do we determine that you know which intake stroke is for what cylinder well if you think about the four strokes you have after top dead center compression that's where we're going to start right here this would be top dead center compression. The next 180 degrees would be the power stroke if there's an ignition event happening. Expansion stroke if you're not, if there is no combustion, if you just have, like if you have a pressure transducer in a cylinder, but I'm getting off to subject here and I apologize. The next 180 degrees is the exhaust stroke. The following 180 degrees is the intake stroke. So knowing that, Basically, at 360 degrees, your exhaust stroke ends and your intake stroke begins. 
you know that the intake stroke for your triggered cylinder is going to start at just after 360 degrees from that ignition event. So that's how we determine that this here is the intake stroke for cylinder number one. And then you just put your firing order in, 18726543. Now, going back to analyzing this intake stroke just a little bit, for those of you that aren't familiar, and even for those of you that are, it's still cool to talk about this stuff from time to time. What we're looking for is each time a cylinder is on the intake stroke, again, our pressure transducers in the intake manifold here. So once the intake valve opens for that cylinder and drops, it falls or gets pulled down into the cylinder by the crankshaft, of course, that piston is going to be pulling on the intake manifold, causing a drop in pressure for each, t each cylinder's intake stroke. So what are we looking for here? We're looking for each cylinder's pull or drop in pressure. That's from here to here and from here to here and here to here. We're looking for them to be pretty consistent. And at a glance, you can see right away that these might be, these four here for especially, one, eight, seven, two, are definitely consistent. The other ones look a little bit strange, and that's repeatable. You can see that from the start of the next um, cycle here. So what's going on? Well, intake and let me talk about this a little bit better too. Why do we have a pressure increase here? Well, think about this. Cylinder number one's intake stroke, we have them this divided into eight partitions. The reason that's because we have eight cylinders. But we know we have four strokes. So the intake stroke for cylinder number one is 180 degrees. If And we're only showing roughly 90 degrees here because 720 divided by eight is 90 degrees. So the intake stroke should go continue on for at least another 90 degrees for in cylinder number one. So why are we not seeing this continue to drop? That's because the next cylinder's number intake valve opens, in this case cylinder number eight. One cylinder eight's intake valve opens, the pressure increases. Why does it do that? I'm glad you asked. Unfortunately, I can't uh, interact with you guys because it's a video, so I'm going to have to create my own uh, manufactured interaction here. So I hope that doesn't annoy you too much. But the pressure increases here because cylinder number eight's intake valve opens. But if you recall, we have overlap. So once cylinder eight's intake valve opens, the exhaust valve is still open for that short period of time, which is why we have a pressure increase because our pressure transducers in the intake manifold reading intake pressure once the intake valve opens, we're now reading the pressure in the cylinder, but because the exhaust valve is still open, we're reading pressure in the intake manifold, the intake, the cylinder, and the exhaust at the same time. And because the exhaust is closer to atmosphere, it dilutes the pressure in the intake manifold, and that's why we start to rise again. Once the exhaust valve closes for cylinder number eight, the cylinder number eight still on the intake stroke, the intake valve is still open, and now we start to pull the pressure down in the intake manifold again. So what are we looking for? We're looking for consistencies. We're seeing that that's the case for at least these four, but something crazy happens here. Cylinder number two's intake stroke keeps going on. We know that this thing should be longer than 90 degrees, should be 180 degrees, so that it's normal, right? No, it's not normal because we just talked about how the next cylinder's intake valve will open and you should see a pressure rise because the exhaust valve is open for momentarily. Why are we not seeing that here? Well, we're not seeing that here because, and guess what? The anomaly starts where our cylinder misfire, on the cylinder that our cylinder misfire is taking place at, which is cylinder number six. Let's go ahead and go back to here, which is the start of it. Cylinder number six intake valve never opens. If it had opened, the exhaust valve would be open at the same time and the pressure would come back up here like it did on all of these. But because the intake valve on cylinder number six didn't open, you're seeing cylinder number two's, you're seeing more of cylinder number two's intake stroke. So cylinder number six intake valve, it either didn't open or didn't open very much at all. And cylinder number six is no longer has an intake stroke. So why is it not in there? Well. Here's what I think is happening, guys. Why is cylinder number five? I can tell you now, in hindsight, I've already checked cylinder number five just to be sure. And cylinder number five uh, going in cylinder it looks like everything's fine. So why does cylinder number five not have an intake stroke or it doesn't appear to have an intake stroke? This is what I think is happening. Because cylinder, we know cylinder number six intake stroke should be 180 degrees, but we only show really you can only see 90 degrees of it because the next cylinder's intake valve opens 
and we can we can repeat that over and over and over again. I think you guys get it. But ultimately, we're not seeing an intake pull for cylinder number five because usually during cylinder number five's intake pull, what, or what you would see as an intake pull he, here, you would also have cylinder number six pulling on the manifold at the same time that cylinder number five is. And because cylinder number six intake valve didn't open or didn't valve open very much, you're not having two cylinders pulling on the intake valve uh, intake manifold at the same time, so you're really not seeing that intake pull for cylinder number five. Right here, cylinder number five's intake valve does open. That's why pressure starts to increase because the exhaust valve on cylinder number five is open. But you're not really seeing that intake pull for cylinder number five. And this is what I suspect is the case because, again, in hindsight, cylinder number five is fine. You're not seeing it because you're not cylinder number five's on an intake pull, but cylinder six is not. So you don't have two cylinders, again, pulling on the intake valve at the same time. Cylinder number four val intake valve opens, pressure increases, and cylinder number four during the intake stroke, the pressure drops. So that's what we have going on here. And to back it up, we decided to go in cylinder just to take a look at what we have. And here's cylinder number six. And if you'll take a look at the, we should probably make sure that we explain this a little bit. Probably better to explain it on a good cylinder. This is a good cylinder. Uh, Red Trace is a pressure transducer in a cylinder number one in this case. So uh, this is top dead center compression. That's why you have the highest pressure at this point. This is expansion stroke, otherwise known as power stroke, uh, conventionally speaking, if there's a combustion event taking place. But because there's no ignition event or combustion place taking place, we can't really call it a power stroke, so we call it an expansion stroke for when we're anal analyzing uh, pressure transducer waveforms in cylinder. So here, top dead center compression goes to bottom dead center, during the, con again, conventional power stroke we call expansion stroke here. The next stroke from bottom dead center to top dead center is exhaust stroke. Well, between the, in the expansion stroke, before bottom, uh, the exhaust stroke, the exhaust valve opens. That's what happens here. Exhaust valve is open, starts to open here and remains open during this entire exhaust stroke into the intake stroke. That's cool. Um, that's the way it should be. This is a good cylinder. At this point, somewhere around the 360 degree mark, or just after the exhaust valve closes, but just before it or right about it is when the intake valve opens. So both of them are open around, right around here. Once the exhaust valve closes, now the uh, piston is during its intake stroke, the pressure will drop, and you'll be reading here what's basically the pressure in the intake manifold because the intake valve is open for this cylinder, which is cylinder number one. Now, that's the intake stroke. We're starting at top dead center exhaust and going down to bottom dead center during the intake stroke. And then the compression strokes your next stroke. You go from bottom dead center to top dead center. So why is the pressure not build up immediately? It's because our intake valve is still open, and that's normal. It remains open for usually about a third of the way through the compression stroke. It changes for vehicles, especially modern vehicles with uh, valve timing uh, strategies. Everything's not, it's hard to find anything conventional anymore. But uh, yeah, that's pretty typical to see the exhaust intake valve close about a third of the way through the compression stroke. And once the intake valve closes, of course, the piston's on its way up during that entire compression stroke, you start to build pressure. And this is normal. This is a good working cylinder. Idle compression is 125 PSI. Remember, guys, cranking compression is much higher, so don't be freaked out only seeing 125 PSI here. The compression at idle is lower, and the reason for that is because we're starting with a lower pressure in the intake manifold during the intake stroke, because the intake manifold pressure is lower at idle than it is cranking. So that's good. Uh, 125 PSI. If you look at our second cursor here, it's negative 8.5 PSI. What do we think is fairly good at sea level for intake manifold pressure? We just said during this intake stroke, we would be reading intake manifold pressure. Um, and what do we expect to see at sea level under a good engine? Traditionally speaking, again, all of these things changes with the different uh, cam timing strategies. But conventionally, we would see 18 to 20 inches of mercury and the manifold. Uh, the rule of thumb is 1 PSI for 2 inches of mercury, so this would basically be 19 inches of mercury uh, negative pressure in the intake manifold, which is, is, is pretty good. So let's take a, another look at our bad cylinder again. This is cylinder 6. Our compression is only 16 PSI. 
our pressure during the intake stroke, or what should be the in stroke, is intake stroke is negative 15 psi. Have you guys ever seen negative 30 or 30 inches of mercury in the intake manifold? No, you haven't seen it because it's probably not possible. The reason it goes so far, the pressure drops so much, is because the intake valve is open. We're not measuring or referencing the intake manifold pressure here. This is strictly cylinder pressure and it's so far negative is because the piston is going down during the intake stroke against a closed intake valve. Intake valve is not closed opening or it's opening very little but I suspect it's not opening at all and uh, this is kind of indicative of that. You usually see again good cylinder intake valve opens really early in the intake stroke it drops down and plateaus. It stays pretty straight and then it starts to curve up during the compression stroke. Well, here you can see that it's slowly decreasing in pressure and kind of looks like a half pipe uh, if you're a skateboarder. Just kind of symmetrical on both sides of this pressure drop and pressure increase. And you can see here the pressure starts to increase immediately after the during the compression stroke. Well, we just said that it's normal for it to be very plateaued here until about a third of the way in and then start to climb up. Well, you can see if you were to zoom in closer, you could see the pressure start to rise pretty much immediately because the intake valve never opened. So it's been so it's closed early on in the compression stroke. Uh, if we can't pull air in because the intake valve's not opening, then we don't have anything to compress, which is why we only have 16 psi uh, compression. So there you have it. Uh, there you have it. This was more or less just kind of uh, just us wanting to hang out uh, with you guys. Miss you. And I uh, wanted to show you the 4425A. Pretty excited about it. Uh, look for more videos. If you like our stuff, maybe not so much this one, right? But, <laughs> but some of the other ones are pretty cool. <laughs> if you like our stuff, don't forget to like. Uh, hit the like button. Hit the bell for notifications. Subscribe to our channel. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, obviously. There's all kinds of really cool webinars available if you guys are not taking advantage of them. Uh, please do so. Brian Colado with Trained by Texas has done an amazing job looking at uh, setting up the uh, events page or the webinar-based training uh, tab, I believe, under our website. That's www.trainedbytex.com. He has pretty much uh, everything that he knows of, which is probably very close to all of the webinars on that calendar so be sure to take a look there and uh, take advantage of as many of these webinars as you possibly can that's kind of one of the silver linings in this whole weird pandemic so again thank you so much for your time and attention i uh, wish this was a little more exciting of a diag for you we really uh, again it was mostly just to kind of show you the 4425a because we're super super duper excited about it so thanks again you guys uh, take care and uh, we'll see you next time